Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, The Unthinkable Thought, from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from Psalm 77, 11 through 12. Last Sunday we discovered we had something of what Hollywood calls a cliffhanger in the 77th Psalm. We discovered that the man who wrote this psalm went through an experience which many of us have had, or many of us will have one time or another in the life of faith. Here's a man who faced a very distressing circumstance, which is never named for us, but which sent him flying to God for help. And he tells how he prayed, and he wept, and he tried to meditate all night long. But to his great distress, he received no help from God. Apparently, the lines were all down. The skies were as brass, and there was no help given to him. And as a consequence, doubts began to rise in his heart. In his heart, and questions were formed that he couldn't answer. And he suddenly realized that the problem that he faced in the circumstances that had brought him to God in the first place was being dwarfed by a much greater problem in his life. That he was really being faced with the question, is God real? Can he be depended on? Is faith valid? And he realized suddenly that he was facing the possibility of losing his faith completely. And this frightened him. And as we read in this psalm, the first ten verses, we saw that he seeks to face these questions honestly. Here's a man who's not trying to evade. He's trying to be honest with the facts as he sees them. And uh, the apparent logic of the questions that arise in his heart, growing out of his circumstances, seems to drive him to a conviction he doesn't want to come to. But he, he finds no way out of it. Evidently, his own thoughts went something like this. He says to himself, here I am, desperately in need of help. This problem that is before me is tearing me apart. I'm all upset. I'm coming apart at the seams. I, I've got to find some help. And he's come to God. And he says to himself, this is where uh, all the promises of God point that God offers help in time of need like this. But I've called upon him all night long. I've wept before God. I've pleaded with him. I've entreated him. I've thought about what he said. I've tried to find help. And no help has been given. And the only apparent conclusion to which he can come, he expresses in verse 10. I say, he says, this is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. God is changeable. God cannot be depended upon. His promises are not valid. And with great affliction of heart and mind, greatly distressed, he expresses what the logic of his circumstances has driven him to. Now I think you'll recognize many of us have had or perhaps are having this very problem. It's a familiar one in the life of faith because every time we get into circumstances of great pressure, we find ourselves facing the open door to temptation, to doubt, and to question the foundations of faith. And that's where this man is. Now in verses 11 and 12, we have a sudden change of direction in this man's thought. He says, I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. Yea, I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate on all thy work and muse on all thy mighty deeds. And as you read on, it's very apparent that this man at this point has made a great change in his thinking. Uh, instead of doubt and despair, as has been expressed in the opening verses, there now comes a growing sense of confidence and a sense of peace which he expresses in prayer to God. And it concludes, as you'll note, the last verse with a statement of trust and rest. Thou didst lead thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. 
reminiscence of the words of the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now to understand what's happening in this man's experience, we must ask ourselves certain questions about this psalm. And may I urge this as a standard procedure to you when reading the scriptures? Ask yourselves questions about the writer and his circumstances and the background and what he's facing, and then seek to answer these questions. This is the way you get something out of the Word of God. There are a lot of people who treat the Psalms especially as though they were some kind of a tranquilizing drug. Uh, you know, you just pick a psalm when you're a little depressed or you don't feel very uh, happy and you read one of these psalms and it has a quieting, soothing effect upon you and that's all you want. And uh, it's true that you can use the psalms in this way. They do have this soothing effect. They're beautiful words, beautifully put. But that is never the intention of Scripture to be merely a soothing uh, emollient for some of the distress of life. I think a lot of people come to church this way. They like the service, the beautiful music, the joining together and singing has a soothing effect upon them. And many people come to church just for that. They like the temporary relief of their feelings that comes when they gather in the congregation and sing some of these songs and hear the prayers and they can go away for a little while feeling a little bit better. But you see, that's really on no different a base, a basis than the world lives. There are things in the world that will give you that kind of an effect. You can pick up a, a book. You can go to a meeting and there uh, uh, people perhaps may sing some cheerful songs encouraging you. And uh, you can get a lift for your spirit that way. You can go to the bottle that you've hidden in the closet at home and get a temporary lift like that, or take a drug of some kind. But none of this, you see, is, is, uh, is, is, strikes at the basis for which the scriptures are provided. I've been so struck by that closing verse of the first uh, letter of John that we looked at just a few days ago, where John says, The Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. I love that. Because that's what the book, the book is all about. It's to give us an understanding of life. We're to see things as they are. And this is the glory of the Psalms. If you ask yourself questions about these things, you'll see behind some of the circumstances of life. And in following through what happens to the writers of the Psalm, you'll get the great illuminating point. That is the intention of God in giving us the scriptures in the first place. Now, learn to ask yourself questions about the psalm. And at this point, there are three questions I think we need to ask as to what happened here to this man. And the first question is, what changed this man so drastically, so suddenly here? From his attitude of despair, of... Uh, of, of uh, uh, a simple uh, hysteria almost to a, a determination at least to take a certain line of thought what happened in between verses 10 and 11 what changed this man the second question we must ask is what did he do then how did he proceed next after the change had come that launched him on this path that led back at last to trust and to peace and the third question is, why did this whole circumstance of unresponsiveness occur? Now, aren't those the questions that come to your mind and heart as you read a psalm like this? Well, don't stop when those questions come. Seek out the answers yourself. And in doing so, you'll get at the very point that the scripture is intended to bring. Well, let's come to this first question. What changed this man? Why does he suddenly revert from these expressions of despair and grief and affliction to this determination expressed in verse 11? I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. Yea, I will remember thy wonders of old. Here he is almost swept away by a flood of doubt. He's been caught up in a wild torrent of emotion that has 
brought him to the very edge of despair. And even he even puts the terrible thought in the words here. This is my grief, he says. This is my affliction. And as I see the circumstances, I'm driven to this conclusion that God has changed. The right hand of the Most High has changed. But then he stops. And he completely reverses his direction. Now why? Well, it's because he saw where he was heading. He saw what the next step would be, and he drew back from it. He had admitted to himself that God could change, and he suddenly saw that the next step would be, inescapably, God is not really God. If God can change, then he's no more than a man. If God can alter his purposes and be unfaithful to his promises, and does not come through with what he's promised, then he's no more reliable than a man. And if God can change and is no more than a man, then perhaps there isn't any God. Maybe he's but a projection of man's thought. Maybe he's just an expression of the desire of man for a father image, as we're often told, that has been projected into eternal proportions, and there really isn't a God. And when he saw that as the next inevitable step, he drew back from that. You see, the fundamental declaration of Scripture about God is that God cannot change. This is the very essence of the being and character and idea of God. He's changeless. He remains the same through all the centuries. He cannot change, as James puts it, uh, with him there is no variableness, neither even the shadow of turning. He's absolutely reliable. And that's fundamental to the idea of God. If you have a being who can change, you really don't have a God at all. That's what the pagans have discovered. And why the pagan world is always a world of uncertainty and of doubt and fear. And they're held in the grip of anxieties and fears which they cannot dispel because their concepts of God is, uh, uh, are, uh, is that he can change, that he's no different than a man and no more reliable than a man. So you see, this is fundamental. And as this man came driven by his emotions and his thoughts to this conclusion that God has changed, he was suddenly appalled and struck by the thought, the next step, is to deny God exists. And that caught him up short. That stopped him. And it gave him pause. He was faced with what to him, for the moment at least, was an unthinkable thought. He could see that it was a plunge back into darkness, back into fear, back into uncertainty, back into all the uh, anxiety that arose, that constantly arises in man who thinks himself to be a creature alone in the universe with nothing beyond and in the grip of powers and forces greater than he can control. And that stopped him. Now don't misunderstand. It didn't answer his doubts. It didn't uh, solve his great problem here at all. It simply stopped him in his downward course for the moment. That's all. It made him change his approach. He saw over the edge into the abyss below, saw where it, this wild torrent of emotion was carrying him, and he suddenly stopped at the very edge and refused to go further, decided to re-examine his position, come at it from a different point of view, forced him to broaden his view, and that's eventually what saved him. You have a similar situation to this in the 73rd Psalm. If you want to just flip back a page or two, you'll find the psalmist there facing the same kind of a problem. In verse 2, he declares right at the opening of the psalm, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had well nigh slipped. Here's a man in the same position, almost on the verge of utter loss of faith, completely. And his problem was the... Was the uh, prosperity of the wicked and how they could 
uh, how they could live so untroubled, such untroubled lives. And uh, this had gripped him. Why do the godly suffer? And the wicked live such untroubled lives, apparently. And he says in verse 13, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. That is, that's what he was about to say. He'd thought this, but he hadn't said it yet. And in verse 15, he stopped by that thought. He says, But if I had said I will speak thus, I would have been untrue to the generation of thy children. What stopped him? The idea that he might do somebody else some harm by expressing his doubt. So he kept it to himself and it made him stop a moment. Now it didn't, like, like in this psalm, it didn't, it didn't answer his problem. But it changed his direction enough that he began to find the answer. And this psalmist, this man in Psalm 77 has gone even further. He has said what's in his heart. He's voiced it. It is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. But then he's stopped by his view of where this idea is taking him. And he pauses for the moment. Now, let me come away from this a moment to suggest that this is a very good thing to do when you're in time of doubt. It's a good idea to look on to the end where you're heading. Let this line of thought run itself out to its conclusion with you. See where it's taking you. This is a very good thing to do. In other words, when you're confronted with doubts about Christian faith, drain the cup of doubt to the dregs. Look at it squarely. Run it right out. I find many Christians afraid to do that, especially young Christians. They really are afraid that if they trace it out to the end, they will be driven to lose their faith. They'll discover that this is but a psychological trick, a bit of religious hocus pocus, that they've been deluded and they've received great blessing from their faith. It's been a comfort to them and they're afraid to look their doubts in the, in the face. But don't be afraid of that. This man was driven by his circumstances to this, but it's a good thing to do deliberately. Run your doubts right out to the end. See where they're taking you. Spell it all out. Because when you see the end, it'll make you stop and see if you've overlooked something. It'll make you realize that this is a serious matter. That it's involving you in a fundamental change of philosophy that's going to affect everything in your life. Everything you do. And when you see the end, it'll make you stop and take another look at where you're going and how you're arriving there. In the New Testament, you'll notice this was evidently the experience of the Apostle Peter. Remember in the sixth chapter of John, where Jesus said some very severe things to his disciples, very harsh in their ears, very demanding things. And as a result of that, we're told that many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And as Jesus saw the crowds going back, and just incidentally, we make so much of the attractiveness of the Lord Jesus and the way he drew the crowds to him, and he did. But you can't read the Gospels honestly without seeing that there are times when he deliberately says things that drives them away, sends them back. And he was always sending people home. And when Jesus saw the crowds going back, he said to his disciples, Will you go away also? And the implication is, if you want to go, go ahead. I'm not going to hold you. If in thinking through all that I've said, and feeling the full force of what I've been saying to you, you want to go back, go ahead. And you remember Peter's reply? It's a wonderful word. It's a great word. Peter says to him, Lord, to whom can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Now that indicated that Peter had been thinking about this. He'd actually been contemplating going back. He was saying in effect, look Lord, you're a very difficult man to live with. You say things that upset us, that disturb us. 
we think we've got you all figured out, and then you'll come up with the most outrageous statement that throws us all a kilter. And it's very disturbing and very upsetting. And we think we know where you're heading, and we've got, uh, we, we, we understand the principles by which you work and live, and then you'll do something that absolutely floors us. <laughs> And we thought about going back. We've looked into the matter. We've examined the alternatives. But Lord, we've come up with this conclusion. To whom can we go? You know, that's a great word. Because if you're not going to go with Christ, who are you going to go with? You have to go with somebody. You're not going to invent a new system of religion that the world has never heard of before. I know I run into people who constantly think that they're going to do this. <laughs> but when you ask them to tell you what it is, it turns out to be the same old hogwash that's been set forth for centuries. <laughs> no, you're not going to come up with anything new. And if you leave him, where are you going? To whom will you go? What leader are you going to follow? What philosophical school, what line of thought are you going to pursue? <laughs> Peter's word is a great one. We've come to this conclusion, Lord. To whom can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You have done something to us that no one else can do. Despite the difficulties we have with you, Lord, there's something about you and about what you've said that have enriched our lives beyond any, any other man's capacity to do so. And we've just concluded, though we don't understand where you're going or what you're doing, we can't go anywhere else. Now that's where this psalmist came, you see. To whom can I go, he said to himself. Where am I going to go? Where is this taking me? Why, there's only one possibility. This whole line of thought is taking me right back into uncertainty, into despair, into confusion, into darkness, into a world in which there is no God. And all the accompanying emotional uh, pressures that that kind of belief always brings upon a man. That's where it's heading me. And that made him stop for a moment and pause and rethink his position. I sat just this summer and talked with a, a Christian, a Christian leader who's been used of God in great ways, who was facing this very problem. And his faith was absolutely threatened. And he was on the verge of throwing over his, his work and his whole lifetime of service for God because he was facing this very issue. And as we talked it through, he saw this, this, this thing too, that uh, there was no place else he could go. That at least he had to stop and think because there was no one else to go to. And that's where this man came. Now that changed him. That stopped this man. He found a foothold for a moment in his, in his headlong rush into despair. And it uh, made him look on to the end and thus gave him pause. But it didn't solve his problem yet. And that brings us to the second question. How did he proceed from this point on? Having stopped now, what does he do next? And may I suggest to you that's a very important question. It's one thing to be stopped momentarily in your slide into defeat. But the important thing is what you do when you've stopped. Because if you don't do anything, in a moment you'll start sliding again. And this has been the story of many Christians. They've been stopped by something that has given them pause, and then they just, just sit there. They don't do anything about it. But you notice this man does. He immediately decides to try another line of approach. He begins his thinking with God. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. Yea, I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate on all thy work and muse on thy mighty deeds. And the crucial words there are the introductory words. I will. I will. This indicates that he has caught hold of himself. He's taken himself in hand. 
He is no longer the victim of his feelings. That's the point. The mind, the will has come into the p picture again. He's no longer being swept along by his feeling, but the control of his life shifts from his heart to his head. And that's the way God intended it to be. And when he does, the minute he does, he sees that the place to begin is not with himself, as he'd been doing, or with his circumstances, but with God. That's the place to start his thinking. And the proper order is not with prayer and then meditation, with petition, crying out to God, and then trying to think about him. But the reverse, to begin with meditating about God, which leads then to petition based on your understanding of who God is. Now that's the way. And this points up the whole trouble this man has had before. His trouble was he began his prayer with himself at the center. You can see that. His circumstances are the for, in the forefront of his thinking. This problem that he's got, to which, that has brought him to God, this is what occupies his mind. And he's relating everything to this. God is there, but he's only on the periphery. And this man's whole thought is, what's happening to me? And look how I am affected Look how I'm afflicted. Look how I cry and nothing happens to me. And you can see how he himself occupies the center of his thinking. And the result of that is always the same. When self is at the center where we begin our thinking with our circumstances in our self, then the heart takes over and the mind is governed by the feelings and we find ourselves limited to what the Bible calls natural thinking. That is, thinking on a narrow, limited plane, which does not take into consideration all the facts. It's only a limited range of thinking. What the Bible calls natural thinking as contrasted with spiritual thinking. Now you see, there's a very profound psychology involved in this whole account here. Here's the picture of a man who is, who is giving way to his feelings and allowing them to drive him step by step into increasing distress, increasing despair. And uh, uh, he allows his feelings to govern his thinking so that even his thinking, when he tries to think, is all centered on what's happening to me. And uh, what are my circumstances and why don't they change? And he finds himself reasoning even, attempting to be logical, but only on this one plane of thought related to self. And that's why he misses the point so completely. You see, the heart is a powerful factor in human thinking. The, the heart, the emotions, the feelings, when they get hold of us, they bludgeon us. They control us. They make us stupid and do stupid things and react stupidly. And that's what this man is doing. When the feelings control our thinking, then we discover that uh, we're helpless to reason properly. We can't take facts into consideration. We see only those facts which the feelings are reacting to. But when you get, are given a moment of pause, when something stops you, even as in this case, this man saw where he was heading and the terribleness of the conclusion he was facing made him pause and stop for a moment. Then the head and the will began to reassert themselves and take over and he corrected his thinking and began with God. Well, you say, well, why is that the place to begin? What's wrong with beginning with man, with myself? And the answer, I think, is obvious, isn't it? Man is a limited being. Therefore, when you begin with man, your thinking is, is, is necessarily limited. It's hemmed in. It's only taking one side of the truth. But when you start with God, you're starting with the, the total fact of all that includes all other facts. 
You've brought in your vision to take in every phase, every aspect of truth. Someone has described that kind of thinking as cubicle thinking. Truth, you see, is not just a level of thought. It's a cube. It has sides. It has certain aspects that need to be considered. We know how this is. All truth is related to other truth. You can't just take a little section of truth and cut it off and look at that and draw a conclusion from that alone. Because you'll discover that as you relate it to other truth that touches it on every side, this truth must be seen in a different light. This is the whole problem, isn't it, with prejudice? What is prejudice? Well, it's a power that prejudges every condition, limits it, shuts out all other aspects of truth but one. Lim narrows the whole range of thinking down to one particular relationship and then judges the whole thing on that one. That's prejudice. That's why prejudiced people dislike having their thinking broadened. They only want certain lines of facts that agree with what they've already concluded. And they don't want to look at anything else. Don't bother me with the facts. I've already made up my mind. That's prejudice, isn't it? You can see how this infiltrates all of the thinking of humanity. This is the problem with communism. What's the matter with the communist philosophy? Why well, it operates only on one level. It sees man as merely a material being, concerned with economics and material things, and that's all. And it shuts out the whole range of hu human reaction and interreaction that relates to the spirit and the soul. And consequently, it's prejudiced, it's lopsided, it's out of focus, it doesn't relate to truth, and it never will. I've noticed that Christians uh, are usually given to spiritual thinking in most things, but when it comes to politics, they invariably drop right down to the level of natural thinking. And they rule out of their thought all that God has said about human life and the nations of the world and what's going on in the world, and they start talking like any worldling around about which party is best and which candidate can do this, and they completely rule out all their thinking. And when they, uh, all spiritual thinking, and when they get then into the realm of politics, they're no more dependable than anyone else. This is quite often the problem, isn't it? Now this man was prejudiced by his emotions, by his feelings, and they almost drove him into despairing unbelief. But he began to return when his head took over, and he remembered to start with fact number one in life. The existence and the being of God. Isn't that where the Bible starts? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Where else would you start if you want to take in all the facts of life? That's the only program, you see, that faces everything squarely and fairly, related to everything else. You have to start with God. Now, we'll see more details of this in other studies as we go on to see how this man traces this out. How his beginning with God leads him step by step to a growing reassurance that uh, God is there. God is at work. And things are not as he saw them originally. But I want to ask but one more question this morning of ourselves before we go on. Why was God so unresponsive at first? Why this silence on God's part? Why is this man permitted to call out all night long like this and nothing happens at all? Why can't God say something to him to encourage him? Isn't this the question we ask ourselves frequently on times like this? Well, the answer, I think, is quite clear. It's that this sort of thing is always a deliberate action on God's part. This man had not always experienced unresponsiveness from God like this. There were times in the past frequently, perhaps, he had never had this experience before. I think he hadn't. Where he had come to God and he'd found instant help. And he naturally came to think that this is the way God would always react. 
I find many young Christians have this difficulty. When they're first Christians, they get into some difficulty or trouble or pressure or problem, and they come to God and they cry out to Him. And God immediately helps them. He responds instantaneously, as He did with Peter, as the Lord Jesus did with Peter when He began to sink into the water. And He cried out and said, Lord, save me. And right there, the Lord's hand was out to save him. Many a Christian has had that experience. God giving that inward peace, that sense of assurance, that quietness within, that gives strength to face the situation that you're involved in. And this man had thought this would be his experience, but now he comes and, and it's not there. He says he remembered the years long ago and he thought back over the olden days and, and this is what adds to his despair. But now when he comes, there's silence. Nothing at all. Well, now, there's only one answer to that. That's that God has deliberately done this. And he does it in order to reveal to us that it's part of his discipline by which he makes us grow. If he always responded to us instantly, instantaneously, we'd remain children spiritually. We'd never grow up. We'd always be dependent upon him to respond like that. And we'd never learn how to operate as God intended us to operate. We'd always be led by our feelings. We'd be mastered by our moods. And this is why the mark of maturity in a Christian's life is that he becomes freed from the moods that he's subjected to. And the sign of a Christian's growing up is that he becomes stable, steady, dependable. His feelings do not affect him. He still has the feelings, but they don't govern him any longer. He becomes delivered from them. He's no longer an up and down, in an up and down experience, up one moment and down the next. But he becomes stable, steady, dependable, faithful, reliable, as God is. You see? Now, we'd never get, get to that place if God instantly responded to us. We'd soon depend upon our feelings for everything. So God deliberately hides himself at times. And if you are going through an experience like that, you can realize that it's because God is teaching you a lesson you need to know. He loves you. And he's disciplining you. As a father always disciplines the child he loves. In order that he might grow up into maturity. And thus he forces us to operate as we ought to operate as man was intended to operate, from the head, not from the heart, with all the facts, not merely a part of them, beginning with God in our thinking and not with man or ourself, moving from meditation to prayer and not the reverse, realizing that the way we were intended to operate was to first think about God and then on that basis to pray unto him with confidence and quietness and expectation. Now that's the way, you see. That's the way God intended man to live. And my question as we close this morning is this. Have you found this way? How are you doing in your Christian life? Some of you have been Christians for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And you're still as much the victim of your moods, the mastered by your feelings, as you were at the beginning. That's the kind of experience that the writer of the Hebrews refers to. He says, you who ought for the time to have been teachers need to be taught again what are the first principles of the life of faith. How about you? Have you grown up? Have you begun to learn how to handle the temptations that come to you? How to systematically and thoughtfully and carefully Begin where God wants you to begin and work through from that basis. Begin with all the facts, not just a part of them. Have you risen above the limitations of natural thinking and begun to judge spiritually, having the mind of Christ, facing every issue on this basis? Well, that's a sign of whether you're growing up as a Christian or not. Now, that's where we're going to begin next week. Finding out how this man discovered that when he began with God, he could move step by step, logically and carefully, right through to the place of trust and of peace 
and of quietness in the midst of distressing circumstances. Our Father, we ask you to teach us this by the Holy Spirit as we go. We're so confident and so conscious of the fact that we can't learn this merely by intellectual instruction. We must be taught by the Spirit. We must have our minds open to the reality of these truths. And we ask for this as we go. We pray that the experience that we have will confirm what we've learned here. In Jesus' name, amen.